Hello, and welcome to the Go Get the World podcast with me, your host, Matthew Gavin. On this show, I chat to experts from all areas of foraging and wild food to bring you their favorite plants, recipes, tools, and techniques. And there's even some great conversations about life thrown in as well. So thank you for listening. Now, here we go. on the podcast we are talking to someone who I admire greatly a man whose books I and thousands of others turn to every week before we set out on a foraging trip Mr John Wright he is the UK's foremost expert on wild food and has written the foraging guidebooks for River Cottage the show in which he makes a regular appearance and has written his own books the foraging calendar and the naming of the shrew the uh <laughs> we have to get into that one in a bit when John is not talking when John is not taking a group on one of his 50 or so forays into the wild, he can be found giving a course, lecturing in natural history, writing for The Guardian, or spending some quality time with his family in West Dorset. Welcome to the Go Gather Wild podcast, John Wright. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we'll soon find out, I hope so. Oh, indeed, yes. Yeah, everyone's had a good experience so far, so it's very, uh, it's very <laughs> casual and relaxed and, and lovely. I can't say I, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to do this and and say how much of a an admirer I am and how you've kind of brought me into foraging through your writing and and the way you you approach it it's very friendly and conversational and, and approachable for people well yes because uh, people are quite scared about the whole thing really and uh, people come on forays and they do very nervous to start with a lot of them and uh, you have to sort of jolly people along and lots of lots of jokes most of which go down reasonably well <laughs> it's a little bit close to the edge sometimes but um yeah but really it's the foraging them itself that takes them over and uh oh, this is a major part of what I love about taking people foraging is just to see the change that comes up, up upon them. Uh, they sort of very nervous in the, again, a mushroom foray, for example, they're very nervous. First of all, they can't find any mushrooms because they haven't got their eye in. And every forager knows about getting your eye in. Um, uh, but suddenly, around well, half an hour, hour in, they, they really get it. And uh, then you can't stop them. <laughs> and they get very, very excited. And people, people get absurdly excited i mean it's a joy to joy to watch um and uh and i i hear wonderful things um uh, they say uh, the thing i like to hear and i've heard it hundreds of times is a walk will never be the same again and they're actually seeing the natural world almost for the first time uh before that I rather feel that, um, and I think a lot of people still do this, um, if they go for a walk in the countryside, it's just a backdrop. It's like a stage backdrop to their lives. And if they're out with family and friends, they're chatting about, well, that's fair enough, ch chatting about the price of coffee and stuff. But um, yeah, but when you forage, you slow down and you look at things. I've had, um, I've had people in tears. And it yeah. almost makes me tear up <laughs> to even <laughs> to think of that uh, because they, they feel released. I mean, you have this thing, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Mindfulness, that's it. Mindfulness, which uh, I'm sure is very, very good. But this is really natural mindfulness. It comes with the territory, literally. Yeah, yeah definitely. And it's, what do you think that is? That, you know, I, I, is it like innate memory that we have? Because it's so you know, in us to go out and forage? And... It, it is entirely within us. Uh, I mean, this is merely a hypothesis of, a hypothesis of mine. We are, we are animals, we have instincts, uh, we have survival instincts. And um, when you've got to see children, they pick up everything and put it in their mouth. Uh, <laughs> and our, our love of shopping, I think, is, uh, is an expression our love of supermarkets or going to going to the market, which is much better, um, is part of the foraging instinct. I mean, everybody had to forage or hunt uh, once upon a time. People still do. But once upon a time, there was no um, supermarket. There was no corner shop. Um, there were no farms. Uh, there weren't even gardens. So um, the only way to get food was out in the wild. And that's where people went, uh, went um, of course. Um, so we need the instinct to do that. Uh, when we fulfill instincts, they, we tend to get enormous amount of pleasure and um, clarity of mind and peace of mind. 
I think of foraging as a meditative experience. Uh, and, and, you, and I think that's what really does it. People, they, uh, well, peace descends on people. Yeah, because you definitely, you find that when you're you're in, say, even a woods and it's silent and you're reaching down and you're, it's the smells even, the even the, the smells we can't smell, you know, these pheromones <laughs> that are being put out and how they affect your body, I think, is, is a, is really interesting yeah because we are we are interacting with the natural world in the natural way and i think i think that's what does it yeah yeah it's a great way to sum it up you mentioned um that's a bit meditative and this mindfulness and things and i know you were a country cabinet maker am i right at one yes stage? that's yeah that's a very uh, interesting job um it's possibly the worst way way of making a living on the planet <laughs> well obviously there's far worse ways but uh, um yeah don't uh don't say, don't, say don't put your daughter on the stage mrs worthington but i think is don't let your uh, let your child become a cabinet maker unless he enjoys being poor who's got plenty of money to start with and it doesn't really matter if he owns anyone or not um it's a it's a lovely thing to do people were very envious of me but uh, i would get uh, customers down from london and um or yeah, they might have a country cottage nearby and uh, they oh, so envy you and I thought well yeah I, I can see it but you know you're on a hundred thousand pounds a year I haven't paid tax for 20 years because I haven't reached the tax threshold literally <laughs> that really happens happened wow. uh, but it was it was nice and of course uh, well I suppose it's all part of the touchy feely side of uh, I mean literally touching of wood yeah, and the yeah. smell of wood and getting to know the trees and how things go yeah yeah and is that how you got into foraging like through that kind of working with your hands and then um coming down or, or how no not fire? really no um as with many people I did forage as a child um taken out by my pe parents we didn't do this very often but uh, you know um, but every year we do two or three things, <coughs> excuse me, and um, uh, one of them was to uh, to go blackberry hunting, which everybody does, but, you know, a nice formal blackberry hunt is uh, just the best thing in the world. Uh, um, and, and the same, and the other thing we used to do, because I lived in Portsmouth uh, on the south coast of England, and we have Langston Harbour there, and I'm just writing about it now. And uh, that's where we got cockles. I mean, you'd be it's this horrific, mud, dangerous place. You wouldn't let any child out there because we were allowed out there uh, <laughs> with, our, with our parents. And uh, we just put our hands into the sticky black mud, and they come out with cockles. It was, it was the, the whole sort of treasure hunting aspect of that yeah. and um they really quite recently you know, i realized why those things were so enjoyable uh because really they were the um they were the only real things i felt i'd done i mean going to school i hated although i did quite well at school um up to a point um i, I hated school because it was artificial um, i watched television but of course that is artificial uh also in black and white in those days it was even worse um but foraging yeah that was the, that was the real deal that was life. that was life as it should be well, yeah apart, apart i don't expect everybody to go doing this all the time but if you do that every now and then that you, you know you will benefit from it enormously yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was the start, but uh, I didn't really uh, take it out, up much more. I was sort of following mushrooms um, every now and then, but not really to eat. But when I moved to West Dorset, uh, then I, I started uh, taking the whole thing very seriously. We moved to just up the <coughs> hill from here. We're in, I'm in a village now, but we used to live on top of the hill. And um, now a nature reserve. Uh, there was a farm which was uh, just pasture land. Uh, there were just mushrooms everywhere. I was a 20, 15 20 acre field where you could barely walk for the mushrooms uh there was lots of interesting fungi on the downland um because when the fungi weren't there there were lots of interesting plants and uh, when there weren't any interesting plants so you'd be uh we're not far from the sea so you to go down there and look at seaweed as well so uh that was uh that was fairly recently so about 40 years ago so uh, yeah <laughs> fairly recently recent the, the, um... I'm not, actually i'm not that ancient i've still um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not quite 70 but uh this year cheers uh, well, experience uh, can, I, can I 
can I can I drink on on this? Ah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, Cheers. Can I just say to everybody else, I haven't had, I've been really busy writing. I haven't had time to make a brew, so this is from the local shop. At least I'm at least not I'm not opening a can of lager, Matthew. Oh, really. Yeah, exactly. No, totally, absolutely enjoy it. The um, and what so how in Dorset is that where you did you bump into Hugh all of a sudden and. Uh, in Dorset or River Cottage, and how did that come? Yeah, well, I will miss miss Tim because uh, I, do, I do some work at Kink of Nature Reserve, and the guy of, uh, who ran it, I take lots of mushroom forays from there, and the guy who ran it, uh, he said, oh, I was just talking to a television company, you know, he said, um, you know, do you know anybody who's interested, who's good at mushrooms, really someone for the programme? And he thought of me and said, no. <laughs> And he told me, he said, I didn't think you'd be interested. But fortunately, I live next door to a restaurant uh, just over there. And um, they uh, uh, they had the, uh, the crew come in, the, uh, you know, the camera crew, production crew came in for, for a meal one evening. And they said, uh, do you know anybody who knows anything about mushrooms? And I said, well, there's Johnny Mushroom next door. <laughs> Uh, so that that was it. Um, yeah, the first time I actually met Hugh was uh, which is in Bemister down the road when we actually started filming the first one, which I did, which was about truffles. And is that what's that community like? I think there's this whole like I get a great sense from from watching the show anyway um, that there is this community around and and it's 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 great to be a part of a part of it. Um, and is that what you get from from being a part of it, or? or... Uh, uh, do you mean River Cottage in particular? Or, yeah, or River Cottage Dorset in particular. Area? Yeah, I mean there was, uh, you know, it's still there. Of course, everything's uh, everything's down at the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I, what I enjoy most after the, when the programs have stopped being made were the uh, the festivals, and uh, I don't know if we're going to be doing them anymore, which would be a, a great tragedy. Uh, yeah. Uh, but there was just a glorious feel about it. I mean, actually doing the programs itself i mean I, I people have told me it looks like fun it's a lot more fun than it looks so it, it was it was just hilarious uh, to yeah. do it and uh, uh, yeah very very funny and uh, we were we were all great friends and i still see i still see some of them every, every now and then. i still see gil the chef and uh, and steve and hugh but, uh, yeah it's brilliant and you do a lot of uh, like your own mushroom farries and and even anything edible and take people out obviously with covid that doesn't happen but you'll still do it after covid yeah well i managed to do some uh, i managed to do all of my own all my mushroom forays last year because they were in october and we could go out for educational purposes so we got away with that i think everybody was fine i certainly came away yeah. without as much as a sniffle so uh, i guess it was all right and we're out in the wild so not indoors so much um yeah um i'm i will hope to be doing some more um i'm gonna cut down a little bit the writing's taking over a little bit at the moment um yes i hope to do 20 or 30 forays this year maybe 20 yeah there's, there's several planned several planned a river coach hope to do my own but that's sort of rather dependent on permissions which is always a tricky thing when you have to lead a foray you have to get you have to ask somebody if you can go on their land which is fair enough i suppose yeah yeah exactly it's uh it could be can be an interesting one the um that's uh, that's kind of when you're say you mentioned you're writing a lot and obviously you've, you've written all these these books and uh, the bible as i frequently refer to it of the foraging calendar which i turn to a lot to see what's coming up or what what's what i should keep an eye out for now that is such an a knowledge you know and obviously it's been built up over a very long time um um, how yeah. did it go from a lot of people are foragers but not writers and is that some, like writing itself is that something you've always done um uh, not really i was always good at it. i used to get top marks at school and my essays were read i mean it sounds like i'm boasting but you ask the questions i have to answer it <laughs> uh, my essays were read out in class as being exemplary so uh, um i guess i was sort of well, I mean, I, can I can, can I claim a, a slight, small natural talent when it came to writing? So, uh, um, and, a, and a love of words and playing around with them. Yes, I, mean, I just I just love doing it. Uh, I'm doing edits at the moment, which isn't so much fun. Or, although, in a way, it is because you edits means you can improve what you already think is all right. So, uh, this is a good thing. No, it's, it's a great, great, great joy. I did used to uh, write articles for the local parish magazine, mostly to annoy the vicar. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this is when well, you were a kid. He was really it? annoyed. 
<laughs> or no, what would those articles be? How would you annoy them? Oh, this is this is what uh, ten or fifteen, well, fifteen years ago. I used to write. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I, but I have read about it a lot. And uh, I, I, I mean, the one that really upset him was a refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity using um, uh, using biblical sources only, scriptural <laughs> sources only. Yeah, yes, he does. I didn't realise how important that was. <laughs> you, weren't, you didn't think we'd be talking about that, did you? Really? I'm open to everything. This is what it's about, you know. <laughs> Let's take it in any direction it goes, you know. Which is which is the nice thing about these these type of forms of media, I suppose, you know, where you can just wander on and enjoy beer or tea or whatever you want to do throughout it. So it's a, it, and you get that sense. I, I get that when I'm reading one of your books is they're almost sitting with you either in a pub chatting or having a cup of tea at your table or something, the way you, you talk kind of, it's, a, it's so natural. And even some of the small facts that get thrown in are really good ones that I'll often read it and turn up to someone and be like, do you know this? <laughs> Well, I like to. Um, I, it's quite, they're quite dense. I, I can have a sort of what seems like a cheerful joke, but I shall drop like five facts in that single joke or sentence, even because um, yeah. you see, it's not hard. To, it's not hard. Well, I find it easy to do. Uh, well, I'm glad you like. I think my books are funny. My my uh, current editor. Um, when I when I write a book, I send I put in more jokes than I think they're ever going to allow me, and some of them get a bit you know near the edge, and uh, and then and I rely on my editor to cut them, cut them back for you. My, my editor at the moment, she's a lovely lady, and uh, she hasn't cut any of my jokes at all. I'm actually quite worried. <laughs> maybe, maybe she doesn't get them. You know, <laughs> you finally won her over. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. She doesn't get them, and maybe maybe they really should be cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to that. It's what's is this on a seashore one again, or, or what's going no, on? Can you a, say about it? It's a yeah, yeah. It's called. I kept changing. It. A spotter's guide to the British countryside. I don't get some mention by the way, in quite a good way. Um, uh, a spotter's guide to the uh, to the mysteries of the British countryside, and it's from Piddocks and choke to which is broom or something it's all the weird stuff you see when you go on a walk in the countryside or down by the coast um do you think what the hell is that um so like so like, things like galls which grow on trees usually or plants so they are created by the plant for a parasite usually an insect um things like choke which is a little collar uh of white and then orange on grass stems just about that long um you know don't make any sense things like strip linchets i don't think you get them in ireland but strip linchets they are ma massive terraces which you get in certain parts of uh, england mostly around here i can actually see one out the window um strip linchets they're, they're um, british terraces um birds big birds on trees so it's all that sort of thing where people, people go what's that or what's that for <laughs> or okay I, I know that's a water meadow but something to do with early grass but what's that all about how do they make them how do they work why did they why did they make them did it fit into some broader um agricultural practice which it does uh, that sort of thing so it's a mystery I, lots of jokes in this one well none of them <laughs> cut so uh you think many... let, you might write a joke put all your jokes into one book and, and write a joke book maybe as the next oh thing. no I do. i'm terrible at telling, <laughs> telling jokes Someone will tell me a joke, and uh, and I'm trying to tell it to somebody else, and I'll say, "Oh no, hang on, wait a minute, no, I should have said, I should have, you know, it's just all going, all falls completely to pieces." It's funny. Uh, you sound and you, you strike me as someone who's so curious, and you look, you you're very curious about everything, almost, you know, from and and that seems to be, you know, whether it's very mechanical and and working with your hands and, and curious, figuring out how things work or or how you know what they are. Has that always been yeah. there? Yeah, I think so. And um, I'm, I'm not comparing myself with the great Douglas Adams, but I, I would in this one thing. He said that you can never look at anything without wanting to take it apart to see how it works. And I feel just the same. I'm just very annoyed. So I had to I had to learn computer pro programming once just like just to learn what the hell that was all about. So uh, <laughs> um, is there actually. anything you've you've taken up recently that's that's out there like computer programming or? or... People wouldn't expect. Gosh. Well, I mean, this is not entirely out there, but uh, lichens. I've taken up lichens mostly because I had to. I've had to write an article about it. I got a, 
a long suffering friend down the road who's um, who's a, a, a top lichenologist and he's taken taken me out quite a bit recently there are one or two edible lichens so it's, but it's not really a foraging experience it was just um Although I had to write the article, I can't incredibly fascinating. Um, lots of technical stuff and just unbelievable how these things, you know, they they, they occur just south of the uh, North Pole, about well, a few hundred miles, 500 miles south of the North Pole to within a few miles of the uh, of the North Pole to, to the South Pole. They're just everywhere. Even They even grow in the sea. Well, on rocks, you know, those things you see on rocks in, at low tide, that's, they're often lichens, those bright things. And what are, what's a is is a lichen? I think there's one, and I might have read it again in in your book. Is one that smells brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Ivernia prunastri, uh, otherwise known as oak moss, which is a that's it. stupid name because it's not moss at all. It's a lichen. Moss is a plant, and um, yeah, it's got this chemical. They preserve. It's about a thousand. They're called secondary metabolites. That's things that uh, organisms produce, which aren't primarily to support life as sort of defensive things or I don't know and um, uh, it produces this chemical co combination of, of, of cocktail of chemicals and if you heat it up then you get this amazing smell uh, really astonishing smell um, it smells I, I always tell people it smells like Debenhams at the department store. Do you have them over your, over your <laughs> yeah, way? Well, it's been well, we, we don't have recently. them here anymore. I know exactly. It's, a, it's the kind of perfume aftershave section of a. Uh, it is, yeah. Yeah, oh, but it's really quite, it's quite nice, yeah. And it's a common one, so I think that's fine for foraging. Yeah. Once that's you it. Go mad. And is it, <clears throat> it's, a, it's certainly one to keep an eye out for for people. Uh, is there anything when you uh, take people out that, you know, whether it's, Say we we can almost branch into different sections here, but you know whether it's just general hedgerow, I think is the most applicable to people because it's around them on walks and in you know closer to cities and villages. Besides the blackberries and blueberries, is there anything that people you think should look out for? Uh well, where are we now? We're in March. Um, I guess I guess most well, no, I'm probably not. Yeah, no, it's prime time for birch sap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted have to you, do. Have you ever year. done that? Have you ever uh, done? I had such an anchoring this year to do it, and yeah. I just didn't. I I have a birch forest close enough to me here, and I really Gee. wanted to do it, and I oh. I just didn't. I it was one of those things that I was like, okay, you know, next year is the year that I do. I go full flung at a birch <laughs> sap, but not this year. It's it's really worth doing, um, not because of what you get, because uh, you get basically you get a lot of water. And it's really nice water. I mean, it's one of the best water you've ever tasted. If you wanted to buy it, I think it costs about 15, 20 pounds a litre to buy, because we can understand that. Um, people make wine out of it, but there's no point because it's still water. Um, and, um, uh, and you can make a syrup out of it, uh, which is OK. Uh, but it has a horrific amount of work and huge amount of energy going into it to boil off. 92 percent 98 percent of the water or 95 I don't know. over 90 percent of the water needs to be boiled off or evaporated slowly um and you get a, a not very good syrup at the end uh, but it's great fun to actually collect it and uh, there's the excitement of going back the next day see how much you've got you know you can have uh, you can have three or four liters on a good day i guess i guess there's somebody out there who's had six or seven but uh, yeah if you get two you're doing quite well i think and how how would people how would you use that? You say you just drink it like water, or have you? Even... Well, that's the best way really is to drink it like water. Yeah. You have to drink it quick. It's got um, it's got about a third of the shelf life of milk. It goes off really quickly. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice, but uh, yeah, I think that's but... one of the things that I was so surprised to even know existed uh, because you you know, like as someone just the general consumer of supermarkets and things when you see maple syrup you're like we don't have anything like that here you know you're almost jealous of the canadians being able to do that and then you're like wait birch sap what is this you know yeah this we, we 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 do have it and it's in it's enormous fun but you know what you get is hard it is really not worth the effort yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a, have a, you'll have a lot of complaints about that i think <laughs> so, uh, yeah people people rave about birch sap wine i did a 
um, I did a, a blind tasting once and made the same recipe of wine using birch, one using birch sap and one not. And um, no one could tell the difference, except they thought the one that was tasted, that was made with water was had slight, slightly more uh, complexity to it. So it just goes to show. <laughs> yeah, and making actually touching on wine and and making things like that you've uh, and brewing is a huge passion of yours and it's yes. you might surprise us what you can actually turn into beer or what you can brew <laughs> Well, I, I was very experimental um, in the book because uh, I want people to experiment and it's a great way to learn things. I learned, um, I, I learned lots of things. I most, most thing, the thing I learned most was not to experiment. Now that's not quite true, but <laughs> um, so, some, some of the things I made were, were pretty disgusting, really. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think I left the, all the disgusting ones out of the book. <laughs> <laughs> but again it's the joy of it's the joy of process as well uh I'm, i mean beer making is my absolute favorite thing i'm desperately keen on cider after a terrible accident i had with four pints of it in 1968 i mean some things you just don't forget you really <laughs> uh, i don't actually know what happened but i know something happened and it was you know uh, uh but um yeah but beer making beer making is great and that was a whole the whole one wonder of the process of the uh, the malting process and all of a sudden you get this uh, wonderful flavored uh, liquid come out uh yeah it's a, it's a glory glorious thing to do and so cheap i mean yeah. this stuff i've got you know i got this is, this cost me nearly cost me over two no it cost me two quid um and a bottle of that of a bottle of beer uh if you make it yourself if you buy a sort of bulk malt then um you know talking about tenpence yeah the uh... 11 euro <laughs> no, not ever. Point point one one. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's cheap anyway. No matter who, no matter what you put it's it in. It's jolly cheap. Yes. The uh, we obviously in Ireland have a great you know reputation for whiskey and gin now, and, and there's you know yeah. there's, there was a huge. It used to be anyway here that you know whiskey was everywhere. There was not there was nearly not a town in Ireland that would make that had whiskey distillery in it, and the uh and now it's gin gin is the big boom here and botanicals and have you ever tried you know wild botanicals with gin and or anything like that yeah i did something uh i go to sark every year well i missed last year but uh we going to sark for 10 years one of the channel island channels one of the small channel islands and uh went over there three years ago i think and there was a nice uh, guy from uh guernsey who ran a, a distillery um Whedon's, Whedon's gin and uh, he came over to Sark the same weekend and uh, I had a sort of day free before I took my foray and um, the guy who, uh, who organizes the whole thing the hotel a stocks hotel so could you take uh, could you take him out and uh, we went out we walked all the way around Sark and uh, eventually settled on um, Killian Achillea millifolium. I can't remember the name of it. What's that? Oh, no. <laughs> yarrow. It... Oh, yarrow. Yeah. It's terrible that I can remember the Latin name of something, but not its common name. I was going to say, what the hell? How, how can you do that? That's amazing. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it's amazing. Uh, yeah, and and he uh, that day he distilled eleven. He got, he got us eleven bottles of um, of yarrow gin. Oh, he had all the other stuff in there as well, of course. Yeah. It's going to have juniper, of course. Otherwise, it's not gin. And uh, he was all distilling all afternoon. And um, and we had an, a rather serious cocktail party afterwards. <laughs> I'll drink what, that. Can you, can you uh, remember what it tasted like? Not a thing. No, not a thing. I <laughs> can't remember much about that at all. Yeah. Oh, that Actually, it's, it's funny because I've always wanted to, to brew. I brewed mead before. So, which was yeah. a great thing to when you're it's young and, and early, uh, early 20s and you can whip out a big, huge couple of liters of mead at a New Year's Eve party. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's good. I don't even know what percentage it was, to be completely honest with you. It was, it was high. But uh, is there anything like that? Like that took months and months of preparation. And there's these things that you almost need to, to pick now for later and there's ones like gin that can be made in a day you know what would you recommend people maybe a mix of those uh yeah it's, it's not easy to do things quickly there's a few infusions you can do quickly actually i mean i mean not 
not now, but um, I say I don't like cider and I don't much, but if you're making apple juice and you basically just let it fester a bit, you end up sort of nice in between. It's fizzy because it's still fermenting. Uh, it's alcoholic, though, but not, but not very. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a semi-cider, a semi-cider, and it can be cloudy, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that really works nicely. It's, um, it's a little bit uh, purative, shall I say? It sort of uh, moves everything along a little bit too much. Sorry to be so indelicate. Some uh, people will be into that. I think you'll get a bunch of people now actually running to make that. Ther therapeutic, yeah. shall we say. Yeah, but well, that's that's great. And that's quick because you're basically you've got something to drink within a couple of weeks. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, infusions, some infusions are really long, some very quick. Uh, I mean, the quickest one is rose petal vodka. So I use Rosa Rugosa, which is a very strongly... Um, aromatic rose and uh and that's ready in a, a day two days um not that you'd want to drink it i've i've you've probably read what i've said about this in the book is this is a little bit like drinking eau de cologne and uh and i always joke i know we've all been there you know <laughs> party's over the booze is all gone you stagger up to bed and you eye the dressing table and there's your eau de cologne or your aftershaves <laughs> Uh, but it's a cocktail ingredient, so you have to mix it with something you've already got, something fruity. Uh, like raspberry, well, right? Yeah, it's be yeah, okay. Raspberry juice, raspberry juice, raspberry juice, very be good, nice yeah. with that one. Yeah, and um, sweet vernal grass vodka that's ready in two or three weeks. Um, I've only ever tried that, it's uh, almost time to collect it now. Uh, it's the first, it's called sweet vernal grass, it's early in the year, and uh, uh you just get a load of it, put it in a kiln a jar and leave it for a couple of weeks, three weeks and decant it off. It's a, a sort of British or indeed Irish Zubrovka. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the grass? Is it sweet? Sweet vernal grass. Sweet vernal grass. Right, okay. I'll keep yeah. an eye out for that. The, yeah. Is that easy to find just in Yeah, it's very, it's very easy to find with it wherever there's old pasture. It's not encouraged by the farmer because it's not particularly uh, nutritious for the cattle, but a sort of slightly neglected part. It's very distinct because it has um, it's rather neat flowers, flowers about that quite small, that big, about that diameter. Right. Okay. And, An uh, and dark and very dark in colour. And they often, often lots of in clumps, not cl tight clumps, but loose little clumps. Uh, so it's easy to pick. Yeah, I might give that one a go. I think that's kind of my leave it in a jar for two weeks, and you're and you're fine. It's, it's kind of my yeah. my uh, my level of ability right now for the brewing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is there anything that we, you'd say like even that would take twelve months? Like someone should think about now for Christmas. Oh gosh, a tricky question. It's Probably something not. that you'd take out of a like this is the special Christmas gift you might give or or celebrate with. Well, there isn't anything that you can make now from the wild. Or there probably is, I can't think of it in a hurry. Oh no, I think most of the things are, are flowers. Well, the soon it's April, the the be uh, dandelions around for the dandelion wine. Uh, I'm extremely rude about uh, homemade wines in my book. I don't even know. <laughs> did you notice that? I was a bit rude. Well, a bit. You know, I actually know. I know. I know a guy who makes wines in Wicklow. Here, he makes um, berry wine. It's amazed yeah. strawberry wine and and everything. Uh, it's, it's beautiful stuff. Um, but so I'm I'm a fan of of his wine making. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's mine I don't like. But uh, yeah, I mean, most homemade wines are pretty terrible things. I mean, I'm sorry, they they just are. People yeah. make wine out of the most ridiculous things. Someone was um, talking about Jerusalem artichoke wine. I mean that. I mean there should be that should be a criminal offence. Shouldn't it really? <laughs> That's horrific. Uh, um, well, you can make yeah. dandelion beer. I think can you? Yeah. Like, this is what can you do with a da I think the dandelion is often seen as a weed and people overlook it completely. It's such a shame. What a beautiful plant it is. If you look it up, uh, look at it up close. It's just exquisite. If you look at a field of them, I um, mean, you can you can have ten thousand of them, all brilliantly golden in a single field, and it's such a beautiful sight. If it smelled nicer, then. Uh, you know, you'd be wearing it on your on your buttonhole and all sorts of things in your, uh, and putting them in your hair, not my hair, but maybe yours. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful plant. Yeah, I mean the dandelion wine is, is is nice. It's it's one of the better ones. It's one of the and it's it's traditional. So we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah, I saw someone post that you can. Um, they were sautéing dandelions. 
which uh, so they picked it up and they were like, we're going to saute this later on. So not dandelion heads, just all the leaves from it. I think it was. And I was like, oh, that, that, I, that would, I don't know how bitter that would taste or, or whatever. Bitter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything about dandelion is bitter. Yeah. Um, I tend not to like bitter very much, although it's very much a part of the foraging experience is to have is to put up with things that are bitter and what actually come to love, love them. It's, very, it's actually uh, it's quite good to eat bitter things. Yeah, that's and that's I think one of the things when you start tasting things that are fermented or pickled, especially it's it's flavor, it's their experience taste that you you don't get at all in the supermarket or or whatever. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and one of the another thing about Freud, you do you're quite right, you do get these uh flavors you can't get anywhere else. Um scurvy scurvy grass, you ever tried scurvy grass or wild uh, or sea oh I'm sorry about that. I should have one turned off. Oh. Um, yeah, so sea, sea rocket is, is a, another member of the cabbage, cabbage family, and obviously related to scurvy grass, which is a cabbage. And uh, the flavour is really quite astounding, and not many people would like would like it, but it's, but it's very good for you, and it's you know, nice to get these odd flavours. There's one but you don't get in the super. I've never seen it in the supermarket, which is probably my favourite part, and, you're, and it's around now. And that's black mustard. I don't know if you've tried it, uh, but no, I haven't. It's an enormous plant. It'll grow about five foot, or four foot, five foot high. Uh, pretty from pretty well nothing. It's uh, it grows during the winter, and you can you can pick it up in November through till now and, and a bit later. And it's very bristly as well. Uh, and the first time I tried it, I th I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I got, got a big mouthful and started chewing, and uh, a bit like wild rocky. Then that's got quite nice, and then and then you start hopping around. Uh, but unlike black mustard, uh, unlike uh, wild rocket, you with black mustard you don't stop hopping around because it's just this intense burn. But it's not just a burn; it's a it's not like a chili burn, which is just hot. You know, it wants to set fire to your tongue with some chilies. Um, it's much more comp complex and uh, uh, it was a brilliant experience and you just don't see it in the supermarket sea buckthorn is another one okay you can buy it if you wish to, uh, wish to pay through the nose for it um, but the sea buckthorn is, is, is common fairly common now and um, you, you just can't get it and is, um, um... And that's, that's another flavour you don't get either because it's so acidic um, and, and oily at the same time so it's a, an interesting flavour. Not many people like it, but I do. I love it. I have a shot. Neat. No sugar, just straight. Hard uh, sea buckthorn, really? <laughs> sea buckthorn juice, yeah. yeah. Wow. Like that. that's, that's one. That's one Deep. to try. The uh, And this black garlic, or not, sorry, black mustard. Black, yeah. This is something I have, so I haven't heard of it. And is that, like, would you find it on your faris, like, commonly, or where would you, where would you find it? Yeah, it's it's quite a common plant. It tends to be um, in wastelands. It's particularly common on the coast, um, where you do find it in sort of odd corners. It's not. I don't think it's a native plant. So, like so many non-natives, they find odd corners to live. And um, yeah, but it's, it's quite common on the coast. You have to be a bit careful where you pick it because it's uh, like many members of the cabbage family. It's very good at absorbing everything nasty from the soil, and it's actually used to do that um right. and so you have to be careful so find it if it's on a if, if it's on a rubbish tip then probably best not mm -hmm. to uh, leave it left. Or, a, or, or a disused tin mine or something that, <laughs> that you yeah i don't know <laughs> your your faris sound very adventurous there <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm only joking well, i'm i'm an invet i'm an inveterate nibbler of just about everything so everything uh, I, uh, which so i don't which i don't recommend people do you have to know a little bit about the whole thing before you dare do that but i, I shall nibble almost yeah. anything i made a I bad mistake knows. i made a bad mistake oh, yeah. of um and it's it was this month it was only last week actually that i was out for a walk in a place called malahide castle which is, which is close by it's beautiful grounds a beautiful castle uh, and everything has forest in it and stuff um but i was walking along and i was like oh i knew the kind of sorrel is out you know now and, and you'll probably guess what i'm gonna say so, I know exactly what you're going to say. Yeah, so I was like thinking I was great, and and this obviously, you know, someone who knows a bit about foraging, it, you probably I probably know too little to be dangerous. You know, that type of way where you're slightly confident, but you you haven't experienced yeah. too many bad things, and and this certainly right. took me down a few pegs, which was 
uh, a lord and ladies. Lord and lady, yeah. I don't... Unfortunately, I, I only bit off. Our the... immaculate. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's enough. Um yeah. I I I have tried it just to see what it is and I I nibbled the tiniest tiniest half a millimeter of the tip but that was enough to be uncomfortable. So uh yeah, that that would be really horrible. I mean, it won't kill you, but you just it's just unpleasant, highly unpleasant. Yeah. Uh yeah, it is a common I've known that happen many times. I've known people make lords and ladies soup. I can't, it's kind of, I think, well, it's definitely not like nettles, but uh, it's it's as if, the only way to describe it is it just gets worse and worse in your mouth because, yeah. you know, and it, and you can see the little red dots appear everywhere and yeah. for hours it stings and I'll yeah. never look at a lot, sorrow leaf again <laughs> with, with such vigor <laughs> to just pick right. up and eat it. I mean, they're so fell up, they are so far apart, yeah. botanically speaking. Um, one, um, Aram, uh, Lords and Ladies is a monocot, and um, Sorrel's a dicot. You know, do you remember the seeds we use? Yeah. Uh, so they're a long, long way apart. Um, and very easy to tell one from the other. But I know many, many people have made mistakes. And on my forays, I've actually found it in the basket we carry oh, around. Oh, really? Wow. Where people have like, said, oh, we have some Sorrel, you know, pick some, if you find, find some more Sorrel, and we take it back and uh, pick it and we take it back. And I get back and I always check it because there's nearly always a Lords and Ladies Leaf in there somewhere, if you know, this time of year anyway. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one, put it that way. No, you're not. I'm <laughs> long. I always tell people that if they're going to learn foraging, the best thing to do is to go out with an old git like me because I have I have stood the test of time. Uh, yeah. Sailed through it, really, because uh, even though I've had, well, eaten about 120, 130 species of fungi, um, God knows how many plants, 100. 80 100 plants maybe more um and seaweeds and everything else um i've never had as much as a slight stomach ache touch wood i do that straight away but uh, yeah so I'm, I'm really careful and everybody should be that really careful never jump to conclusions so people who think they know more than they do as you <laughs> already pointed out yeah jumping to conclusions i mean it's been the death of some people jumping to conclusions so we know what's the worst can happen well we know what the worst is so you don't <laughs> don't do it yeah, and that's something. Would you say if you're if you're a beginner forager now, and and you're there's obviously not many courses running at the minute, and people want no. to take a take the first step. It can be it can be very daunting, and I I felt that you know fear of of really like not knowing and and anything. What what would be the first steps for someone to take? Well, you're gonna need you're gonna need a book. I mean, not necessarily my book. I mean, there's lots of foraging books out there. If you, if you do it online, just find out what you can forage. Um, and the, but you will need a good identification book, uh, whether it's for fungi or for plants or seaweeds. And uh, really, you have to do the whole exactly the same as any naturalist would do if he was doing a survey. You have to just learn what these things look like, and they got lots of characteristics. Some of them are really tricky. Uh, some of them are dead easy. Um, and um, people make mistakes, so then they're not just uh, careless and jumping to conclusions. They're quite lazy. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying it's you. I'm sure you're not lazy at all. I was, uh, I was ambitious, I'd say, with that one. <laughs> they won't check everything. They won't check everything, and uh, yeah. then they go, "Oh yeah, that was weird." Well, it's got a pointy thing, and uh, and uh, so and it's a bit green. Um, yeah, that's that's what it is. What they don't look down uh, any further is um, when people pick. You know, people can pick the lords and ladies for wild garlic. I mean, but the, the clue there is to smell it. You know, yeah. If it doesn't smell of wild garlic, and I, I mean, people say they, oh yeah, it was. Um, it, it had all the characteristics, but it was missing so and so. I said, well, just don't eat it because yeah. if it's missing that, it's not. It's not what you think it is. Yeah, exactly. Some some, some characteristics are a little bit more vague, but. To, <laughs> If it's got if it's got serrated edges to the leaves and it's not supposed to, it is not the plant. You think it is. <laughs> yeah, it's funny what people almost they they want it so bad that they try to yeah. themselves. It is it. I I done that again. This is one of those things where you are I'm I'm too forward about it and, and overconfident. Where um, I I was in Mayo and or Kerry actually. This I was in Kerry and we were in this beautiful Kerry beach. And it was it was amazing the amount of different types of seaweed there. And one that I was full sure was sea spaghetti, saying to everyone, I'm going to bring this home. I'm going to collect it and we'll bring it home and I'll boil it up and we'll have some sea spaghetti. 
and I boiled it up and I started eating it and it was like a rope it was like a cord rubber rope that you could that you couldn't even digest phylum like, phylum cordata yeah is that so, the very thin one yep yeah yep. that's a, that is that i mean it makes very good shoelaces actually <laughs> well, <laughs> well i don't know if it does but it it, it, uh, it is just fibrous yeah yeah and of course it's round it's round in cross section much thinner whereas uh, sea spaghetti is uh, sort of oval in cross sections flattened Exactly. Uh, so may, maybe if they called it uh, C. Tagliatelli, you wouldn't have made the mistake. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that's what we need to start calling it now. Yeah. C. Tagliatelli. Right. <laughs> yeah, but a seaweed is one of the things that it's it's very safe for, say, a beginner forager to kind of go out and. You might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that's one no. of the areas that you know people should look to possibly first. Before. Yeah, I think so. If you you know if you've got access to to the sea side then yeah it's it's brilliant because you really can't poison yourself um i would caution people about nibbling bits of seaweed while they're down there because if there's anything nasty in the water it'll be on that seaweed um and it doesn't take all that much uh i i took a friend down to a, a seashore about three or four years ago and he wanted to learn all about seaweed and uh, i said well there's this one and that one and, and he kept nibbling them and he was sick as a dog yeah, it was oh, a terrible no. state. So, so as long as you don't do that, and it's quite easy not to do that, um, it is perfectly safe. There's a few things that uh, you don't want to eat. There's um, this mestia species, which contains sulfuric acid, but there's nothing poisonous. Um, very few, really, which are edible, uh, surprisingly, since very few are poisonous, but most of them are the, well, they're either too tough, like your phylum, or they're too chalky, they're too small, they're too chewy, they're slimy. Uh, there's lots of reasons for not eating them. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think it is a very good way. And also you get the real adventure. I mean, it's a real foraging adventure to go seaweed hunting. and um, Very exciting because you're, you're already down by the seaside. That's why I quite enjoy taking down people down by the seaside. You basically can't go wrong. It's not bucketing down with rain. They're having a lovely time anyway, because that's what happens at the seaside. You have a lovely time. Uh, but we have the overlaid, you have the foraging experience as well. And not just foraging, it's not that you're getting all things like salad vegetables or even mushrooms um you know this is an exciting new adventure you know you can eat this stuff and uh, people go go home and they cook it up and if it's nice and they, they tell all their friends what they've been doing and it's uh, yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's certainly something cult cultural social social aspect of not bragging but just being pleased with yourself and wanting to share that with people yeah, and that's like that kind of t goes back to that sense of accomplishment you, you talked about before, where people really yes. get that. Yeah, you do. It's um, it's an accomplishment, and it's also an ownership. You feel you deserve what you've eating that night because yeah. you put in the effort. If it, you know, if it's if it if it comes on the uh, on the Tesco's van right outside, or you need to go there to the supermarket yourself, yeah, and you pay good money for it, but somehow it's not yours i don't know what that is but it, it doesn't feel like mine but yeah. if i forage it it is yeah exactly I, I completely get that like i've one of the things that's amazing and, and i i got such joy out of it was i made a we were in mayo staying in a house and i made a something for everyone at the time it was a dessert so it was kind of a showstopper i was trying to impress and it was a, a carrageen panna cotta so I used the oh, carrageen yeah. to set the panna cotta and it didn't taste like seaweed. I, I totally recommend everyone to try this because it's just the chemical reaction between, I don't know how it works. You might elaborate on it and tell me a bit more, but it's amazing. Complex. There's three complex carbohydrates, car carrageen, and they just form long chain molecules and bind the proteins together, uh, milk proteins. Uh, yeah. Do you know how many times I've made uh, a seaweed panna cotta, carrageen? I don't know. About 400 because I do, I do it as a cookery demonstration because it's such it's such fun to make and when, yeah. especially when you strain the carrageen uh through the um, through the muslin bag and you squeeze it through and it looks it, it's sort of like a runny nose to start with and it's like lumps of snot coming out so it's a great it's a great cookery demonstration and just whisk it all up and people ca just cannot believe it's going to taste nice but it does kind of better really than because it's a vegetarian if not vegan um panna cotta um and you don't have the sort of uh, stickiness you get with uh, a gelatin one called gelatins well gelatin is used for glue I used to use it with my furniture making days I used to use <laughs> gelatin 
<laughs> and I, I can't believe one of the like seaweed and and it, this kind of touches on cultures and cultures opinions of foraging and and use of kind of what's around them and, and like obviously seaweed in, in Asian culture is everywhere it's, you know it's, and it's they're farming I, uh, even over here in the UK and Ireland there's like a huge export business to ship to Asia of our seaweed but we don't consume it here it is very odd. Um, if you gave the average uh, uh, home chef a basket of uh, eight, six, so I say six different seaweeds, I wouldn't have the faintest idea what to do with any of them. Um, okay, there is stuff online, but uh, yeah, no, there's no culture of it. Well, there is very small culture because in Ireland there is uh, there is a culture of it with. Uh, uh, with dulse or didisk uh, and um and, and here in, in wales and not far from me, from me which is north devon uh, there's a culture of eating lava making lava bread but apart from that that's it really uh, but we do eat it we do eat seaweed of course quite a, more than we think we ever get every, every, every time you go to a sushi bar you'll you have those little rolls yeah. with nori around there which is, which is a lava of course uh, yeah yes yeah, so we insist uh, okay. yeah it's, it is such a shame and i've tried to uh, press people into doing the seaweeds, just giving giving it a go, but you can't you can't buy them fresh because they just don't keep. Uh, yeah. I think that's part of the problem. Uh, they, it just doesn't keep. Um, dulls, dulls, which is my favourite, really. Um, you know, it's it's gone in minutes. That's uh, I have that dried in a jar here. This is from yeah. a beach in Mayo. Um, that, like you said, we were on a walk and I just picked yeah. it up and dried it. And no two. Yeah, a day. I'm sorry, I said minutes, but a day, you know, a day with dulse is is too long unless you uh, unless you're really careful. It yeah. will dissolve because it doesn't rot; it actually auto digests. It just and it goes goes to a liquid. I did I did some I did two talks up in London a few years ago, and uh, uh, and I was showing people seaweeds and various other wild foods at this big show. And, and uh, the first day, I brought all this seaweed with me. First day, it was fine. I was getting a bit tired by then. Um, but I had to come back the next time. I said, have you got a fridge to put this in? They said, no, we haven't got anything. Uh, so you just leave it on the floor. Had, oh. a heated, had a heated floor. When I picked up the bag, it, it, it actually all ran out through the bottom because it was complete, completely liquid. Oh. Uh, it really, really doesn't uh, keep. Yeah. I loved, yeah. Dulse powder. Uh, eat that pretty well every day it goes into everything i cook uh not if i it doesn't it doesn't go into a chocolate pudding but you know every anything savory i cook it goes in because it's uh, it gives you those minerals and uh, some as well other nu nu nutrients um it fills you up and uh and it's a flavor enhancer it really works so well and i've given i do this little mixture of uh un dried onion powder uh dried celery and dried wild mushrooms and dried dulse and mix those all together you put a spoonful of that into anything you're making it's wow. just glory i'm gonna give yeah. that a shot yeah sounds good i guess if you really wanted to go for it you could use wild onions but that would take a time oh stop <laughs> I, I was trying to pick so many wild onions and i was like how am i going to use because they were just there on a walk and i was like i just threw them in the bottom of a roasting tin when i was making a roast and all the other vegetables oh, that's good. And I was like, well, that's one use, but it's again, it's tough to to figure out a use for them because they're so small. You know, a salad or a roast. Yeah, they're not quite as succulent as the uh, as the, the fast grown ones that we use as spring onions, are they? So, no, definitely not. And that's one thing. Like again, seaweed. You know, I think people. It's it's such a shame that we're we're shipping it out. It's all here. We're shipping it out and not using it. You know, locally or or that type of thing. But mushrooms it, or other areas of hedgerow as well that people are walking by and I think you touched on it the greatest sense when you do one of these courses with someone like yourself is it's almost like you're wearing a different pair of glasses after you do it yeah it, 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 it is a big difference and I I get quite well people get quite cross with me people who uh, you know my, my family if I go for a walk with them they I don't particularly like going for a walk with me because it takes so long. My daughter says that the only the only time it's worthwhile going for a walk with me is when it's dark because I can't see anything <laughs> so, and I don't stop. But otherwise, it takes me it takes me too long because looking at everything, not necessarily to um, you know to find something to eat, but just just look and see what there is. It might be a new a gall I haven't seen before. Um, I mean, last last year I found a. Uh, a female, a female uh, glowworm, uh, 
ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. It looks like a horror movie. It's so beautiful when you can only all you can see is that bright light. But yeah, it was all one in daylight. Just you just see so much. You see my husband. Yeah, you do, and it's it's that when you got you know, when you can even name maybe even like ten plants or whatever it might be, or even three or as many as you can when you're walking with others, and and you you get that. I think that it's that sense of it's just more of a sense of belonging, or you're you're walking as if you. I don't know if it's belong there or you're you're much more a part of the landscape when you can tell people beside you, oh, that's this and you can use it for that. You know, we don't need to pick it today, but just so you know. Yeah. Yeah. They they do tell you to shut up after a while though. <laughs> yeah. My 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 family. Yeah. Just dad, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote that down. Yeah. My my yeah, my I was I was writing about that uh, quite recently. Uh, and I mentioned the time that my, uh, I said one of the great things about learning things is you can tell people. Um, uh, and it gives the great, gives you the enormous pleasure of hearing people say, you tell me about that bloody horseradish every time you drive by it. So there we go. That's the, that's the wife talking, but she didn't, doesn't say bloody. She's a very, very polite lady. But uh, yeah, that's... yeah, people get fed up. But I think, uh, I think a lot of people are, uh, I would say grateful they just engage with you in your interest and think oh that's, that's fascinating I'd love to hear people talk I'm, I've learned so much from people who come on my forays they've got some other take on something they remember when their mum used to learn nan used to do so and so with a plant oh, uh, so yeah you learn you learn a lot from other people yeah that's definitely one thing about foraging whether it's you know any aspect of foraging is it's one of the things I find uh, and it's so different to, to most things now is it's almost like a craft, like whether it's carpentry or, or whatever, that y you have to get taught by someone else. You know, it's very tough to do it on your own. Yeah, well, I kind of did. I just had the books. I mean, I didn't have many books. So mushrooms were really hard in the old days. There were so many, when I say the old days, we're talking about, you know, the 70s and 80s. Um, and well, it's until halfway through the 80s when Roger Phillips' book came along. But with mushrooms, it was almost impossible. There was, were no books. There were no books. There was no internet yeah. in 1980, 75 mm -hmm. or anything. Uh, there was no way of, and nobody else knew. But I mean, not as though we ever had the culture in this country of people learning the fungi as they do in parts of Europe. Um, so it was it was really difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, yes, but I'd eaten I'd eaten probably a hundred by the end of the 80s. Yeah, species hundred by eighty five, perhaps. Uh, yes, yeah, so obviously I, I got it right every time. It's, it's one of those here. things where, and I, I think that culture aspect of it is, is a really interesting one, where you you compare, say, the Italians and the Spanish cultures, and there, you know, you can bring a basket of fungi into any pharmacy over there, and the pharmacist can identify it for you. And you know, is that something we yeah. should bring in here? Uh, yeah, well, that will never happen. Much no. as nice as it might be, it would never happen. Uh, but it's not part of their training, and uh, like, they probably have all sorts of problems with insurance if they, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. People, people bring them around here. Uh, people come, come and knock, knock on Johnny Mushroom's door. door. <laughs> yeah, lots of times. Yeah, that's funny. And uh, people were there was one one guy brought some around last year, and uh, and he's. And it was an agaricus, so it was a true mushroom. I don't like recommending people to eat agaricus. You know, I really leave it up to them. Uh, I said, I do the test for the yellow stainer with the yellow staining yeah. business. So you probably know what I mean. Um, and uh, and then you, you can be sure. I said, I can't really see it. This one is going a bit yellow. And, um, uh, but it's not very much. I don't think it's a yellow stainer. Um, I can check with the books we know with the microscope and, and the spore size and various other things and he wouldn't leave them behind because he thought I was lying to him because I wanted to eat them myself I mean it's so <laughs> untrusting people get very people even there's yeah if they won't even tell you the spots where they find some of the mushrooms that they find as well because it's very precious no you don't I mean my uh really you should only tell uh, people who are direct blood descendants. <laughs> so there's only two people in the world who I can tell my spots to. That's my two daughters. The wife, yeah. you know, the wife won't, won't tell the wife. You know, she might go off with a postman. Then a postman <laughs> will know all about my spots as well. So you know, it's just good sense. It's preser preserving the genes. Yeah, there's a few spots <laughs> around here and around around Greater Dublin that I know. Uh, the amethyst deceiver is my all-time favorite mushroom. I think. <laughs> 
eating that the, so the flavor of it it's color you know it's so unique and the flavor is incredibly meaty and and everything else it's a but i have a patch closely guarded that i watch on walks around here <laughs> wow well, so it's, it's, it's a nice common one so uh, yeah yeah no, it is lovely it's very it looks lovely with um chanterelle or some yellow uh, mushroom you get those two contrasting flavors i i always tell people if you if they find things like amethyst deceiver uh, and some of the yellow mushroom like mushroom, chanterelle or trumpet chanterelle or um or even some of the wax caps you can't they're, they're edible they're not particularly tasty um i uh, so just just um get some of those any bright colors you can of edible fungi and just sort of mix them all up you know put them in the kitchen when you've got guests coming around and then oh, i'm sorry about this i haven't turned that off no i can't um, hear that by the way just yeah oh you can't okay that's good um and uh yeah i say uh, people come around for dinner and they say oh you know oh, what are we having and they say well i've, I've got these mushrooms and uh, i say well they're lovely um I just, what are what are they what sort of mushrooms are they and, and you say i've i've no idea but they look so pretty and <laughs> you just got to watch their face <laughs> try one then tell them to try one and see what happens <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant um and you're so you've written a good few books and edible bush is kind of you know where uh, is your presence online along with um, yes. river yeah. cottage obviously as well yeah. but edible bush is kind of the main place that people can yeah people can get in touch with me i mean it's, it's pretty neglected at the moment because i'm not running forays and i uh, i haven't got time to do all the nice things that, that um, my fellow foragers do with sort of advice and so on but uh, yeah is there any is there anything else before I'm conscious of your time here and, and, oh, and we've right. we've just come up so is there rough, yeah. yeah is there anything you'd like to like leave people with or or you know mm. tell them I think it's it's great to you know can you what would you tell to someone who's a bit on the edge about wanting to go out and forage they're interested because they've kind of heard a bit of a buzz around the the, the you know the media you know what would you say to that person who's just on the edge of, of wondering whether to forage or not yeah. yes yeah well tell them i'm an idiot that i survived perfectly well um just just go go out in your back garden go down the hedgerow go down to the beach um get some books um and take and just take it easy you don't need to learn everything i've heard this, this is the takeaway thing you do not need to learn everything all at the same time just one species now another one in a couple of weeks time uh, and so on you can do uh, with mushrooms for example i tell people to do three species a year right. if you do more then that's fine three species a year you know five years you've got 15 species um you know, that's that's a lot that's more than most people I and mean, most people don't know one so 15 species of mushroom is is very easy and just take it just take it slowly uh, and there are i mean in the foragers calendar i say there are 20 species of mushroom i'm picking out mushrooms here um uh, that are, are so easy to identify you you, uh, you have to be completely reckless to get it wrong so just take it take it easy. those 20 easy species giant puffball hedgehog wood, hedgehog mushrooms yeah yeah some easy yeah, ones there easy ones to spot yeah i think that is definitely a takeaway you know if you can even pick up one thing and put it on your plate you know and you and you know it really well like wild garlic or whatever you do get that accomplishment ownership and, and a lot of pride from it yes that's right you know which i which might be a nice place to leave it so everyone anyone who wants to find you i think you know ediblebush.com is your website so yep. you know people can go on to there or you know you can search youtube john wright and you've lots of videos up there you know from river cottage or others interviews with people and if anyone wants to get in touch or go on your courses or buy your books they can go to ediblebush.com and i would if there's one thing people do it's to, to get the foraging calendar i think is, is the main one that uh, i'd recommend people because it's a brilliant one that you can just look at every month there's something new to look forward to in it you know so uh, thanks john thank you so much for your time and i really appreciate you being on the podcast it's a great pleasure thank you very much well i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did visit gogatherwild.com to see notes on what we discussed today and connect with us on social media at gogatherwild thanks for listening happy foraging